May we join in together in singing as we turn in our hymnals to page 57. Page 57. Let's rise and sing all four verses, please. In the cross of Christ. Langley, would you lead us in prayer, please?
receive our morning tithes and offerings. You know, throughout this Christian life, God leads us in many, many different areas. Sometimes he chooses to lead us through the deep waters and the, and the very low valley. And then at other times he, he chooses to lead us on the mountaintops. Sometimes he, he chooses just to let us just go by day by day basking in the sunlight of his love. Then at times he chooses just to let us have aches and pains. But through it all we see the love and the glory of Christ revealed in this. But through it all we see the blood of Jesus Christ revealed. I want to share a song with you this morning if I can get through it. I don't know. Uh, dirty my eyes are sweating a little bit. So uh, I'm going to try to get through this song and I it's, it's a very deeply, uh, deep, meaningful song to me. It tells us about the way God leads us. Before I do, I want to ask my brother, Buddy Robertson, to pray for me. Thank <laughs> you. 
John chapter 15 and verse 11, I would like to read again. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Mark Twain, the humorist, many times entertained others. And yet those who knew him very closely noted that there was a tremendous sorrow in his life. And it came because of the death of a beloved daughter. Outwardly, he could entertain, but inwardly, he was robbed of joy. The Bible tells us that Jesus was a man who was acquainted with sorrows and with grief. And yet the Bible points out to us that this was the happiest, the sunniest individual, perhaps, who has ever lived. Jesus spoke very frequently about joy. He spoke about the individual's lives being filled with, with joy. It was his intent that his people be filled with joy. Now note, that although he experienced sorrows and griefs, and he said in the world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. On three different specific occasions, Jesus used these words, be of good cheer. This was not something that was on the surface, but this was something deep down from within the individual. It was his desire and his purpose that his people experience a joy that would come from the deeper inner recesses of his being. And this will not come from outward circumstances, nor from people, nor from things. It will only come from him, Jesus Christ himself. Now, someone has well said, the world can give us fun, but only Jesus can give us joy. The world can give us fun, but only Jesus can give us joy. Now, I have read from the sayings of Jesus, but primarily what I have to say this morning will come from the writings of Paul, from the book of Philippians. This whole book is centered around the, the feeling of joy. Now, I will have to confess that it disturbs me at times whenever I see professing Christians who do not have this joy. And it disturbs me as a professing Christian at times. When I, Billy Bread, a preacher, a Christian, that I do not have the joy in my life that I ought to have. And so as I've studied from this little book of Philippians, I note that it mentions either the word joy, or the word rejoicing, or the word gladness, 19 times. Four little chapters. And yet, it majors on joy. Now Paul is writing this letter to the Christians at Philippi. He is in prison. The year is A.D. 19, uh, the, the, years, uh, the year is A.D. 62. And he is chained to a guard. He is in a Roman a prison. He went there to Rome to preach the gospel. But there were limitations placed upon him. It is cold. His friends have forsaken him. But he writes back to the Christians at Philippi to tell them that one of the most important characteristics of a Christian is to have joy. Now Paul... If anyone had any reason 
to be under a cloud of gloom and disappointment. It was Paul being in prison, no family, very, very few friends, practically all of them had forsaken him. The church that Rome was divided over him, professing Christians were divided over him. Some thought he was right and some thought he was wrong. Now friends, if you ever think that there's ever an occasion for a preacher to be unhappy and to be a mess of joy, it's that. But here he was. And but he kept writing about this virtue of joy. Now, what about in our lives? How much joy is there? We experience difficulties. We experience problems. We experience heartaches and disappointments. But what about this joy, this quality, this characteristic, this virtue that we ought to experience? A joy. Now, how many times we have listened to the young folk in the midst of Sunday school, church, or youth meetings, or Bible meetings, as they will lift the rafters, singing, I've got that joy, 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 deep down in my heart. Where? Deep down in my heart. It's easy for us to sing it enthusiastically among Christians and those of like mine. But Paul mentioned something that is to be with us in the most difficult circumstances. Now, there are some things, if we're not careful, that will rob us of this joy. And there are some things that will trouble us, and if we aren't careful, they will come and steal away this experience of joy. Now, in John chapter 17, I like for you to note that Jesus, in his prayer, had five petitions. And one of his petitions was this, that we might have joy. And I cannot think of anything more winsome, more winning for a Christian than that he possessed joy. What are some of those things that will take away this joy if we're not careful? One of them is this, will be circumstances. So many times we will allow circumstances to rob us of joy. Now we will have to confess there's very little that we can do about a lot of circumstances. And there are some people who talk about Blue Monday. For the Christians, should that be in a Blue Monday? We speak about the weather. Can we do anything about bad weather? We, exp we express our dislike of the heavy traffic. Can we do anything about it? We express our dislike for various types of circumstances. Now, a teenage daughter named Peggy said to her friend over the telephone, she said, things must have gone pretty well with my dad at the office today. For he just came in, and the tires were not squealing, he didn't slam the door, and he even gave mother a kiss. Now, a lot of times we say we have joy when the circumstances are right. Now, we may be happier when certain circumstances are right, but still deep down there is a joy that I'm speaking about that's deeper than anything on the surface having to do with circumstances. There are those times that people, if we aren't careful, will rob us of a joy. People will rob us of a joy. One day Abraham Lincoln was walking down the street and his two sons were engaged in somewhat of an argument and a friend of his said to him, Mr. Lincoln, what seems to be the problem? Or he says, they have an argument going between them. He said, 
It's just like this. I have three walnuts in my pocket. I have two boys. And each of these two boys wants two walnuts apiece. And how many of us argue many times when there are two of us and there are only three walnuts and each of us wants two? A Quaker watched a very wealthy neighbor move in. And as he watched this neighbor fussing, fuming, frustrated because he couldn't get all the tables and the chairs into the right place, this Quaker said to him, Friend, if thou know of anything that thou lackest and would like to have, come to me and I will show thee how to do about it. So many times our lives become so frustrated because of things, little things. But what did Jesus say? A man's life consisted not in the abundance of things that he possesses. But we miss out on lots of the joys of life because of things. And how competitive we become sometimes over things. When someone has a new color television, a new automobile, a new home, and so forth, how competitive we become over things and we lose a lot of joy and a lot of sleep over things. Over things, over people, over circumstances. We lose a lot of joy over worrying. How much worrying we really do. But how much good does it really accomplish? We worry over people, we worry over circumstances, we worry over things. But how much help has it ever really brought us? What did Jesus have to say in the Sermon on the Mount? Read chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus said, Do not fret over these things. For he says, Your heavenly Father knows what you need. And he says, If he so clothed the grass of the field, and which Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these, if he knows about the spirals and not a single one of them will fall to the ground without your Heavenly Father knowing about them, even the hairs of your head, each, uh, they are numbered by the Heavenly Father. If he knows about all of these things, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We worry, we fret, so many times needlessly, he is saying. But what ought we to do about this? Paul, in this book of Philippians, mentioned these four things I have just mentioned here. And he says these are the four things that rob, rob us. He says in this book of Philippians that people are robbed of their joy because of circumstances. They're robbed of their joy because of people. Many times they're robbed of their joy because of things. Then they're robbed of their joy because of worrying. But also Paul mentions in this book so many times something having to do with the attitude. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. If we would count up the times that he uses the word mind or remember or to think, you will note those 16 times the references to the mind or to the attitude in this whole book. Therefore, he is saying that what we think, our attitude, our frame of mind has an awful lot to do with our living for our Lord, let this mind be in you, 
which was in Christ Jesus. Now he lists the kinds of minds that we ought to have. First of all, he mentions the single mind. The chapter 1 of this book, there's a reference to the single mind. Paul said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul was saying that my main purpose in life is Jesus Christ. Jesus said if you will put him first, all the other things will be taken care of. The single mind. James said that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And how unhappy we become because we're double-minded or triple-minded. But a, but a single mind is what Paul is referring to here. For me to live is Christ. He was saying my whole goal, my main ambition, my main purpose in living is Jesus Christ. And no wonder Paul was such a radiant individual. No wonder Paul could write in the midst of a cold dungeon, forsaken by friends, that joy possessed his entire being. Paul also said in the same book of Philippians, this one thing I do, there is a single mind. But friends, if we say that we're going to serve Jesus Christ and at the same time become troubled over circumstances and people and things. Then he's, then he's saying that we are not serving Christ properly. If we are of a single mind, then we can have joy. Then chapter 2 tells us of another kind of mind. That was a submissive mind. And he stated that Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be counted to be equal with God. But he emptied himself. And he became a servant. And he submitted himself to the mind of God. And then he tells us to submit ourselves to the mind of God. In chapter 1 he says, if you're single-minded, circumstances won't bother you so much. In chapter 2 he is saying, if we have a submissive mind, then people won't bother us so much. Note that, people won't bother us so much. A submissive mind, submitting ourselves to the mind of Christ. I read this some time ago, a few days ago, a mother and a son got on the elevator, and they're going up to the doctor's office. Well, just before the door, door closed, quickly walks in this lady, uh, shall, how shall I describe her, tactfully? Anyway, she came in, and she was a little bit on the large side. And she, when she came in, she turned around and began to back towards the back of the elevator. The door closed, and the elevator started up, and all of a sudden there was a scream from this lady. She turned around, and she said to this mother, Your son bit me! And the little boy looked up at his mother and says, she sipped it on me, and I bodied her. <laughs> now, there are a lot of times that people will sit on you, and you want to buy back. Hmm? How many times have we wanted to bite back when someone would sit on us? Paul said, when we submit ourselves to God, we do not want to bite back. Yes, there are all kinds of people who would trouble us. But Paul had gained victory. Then, there is, in chapter 3, 
There is the spiritual mind. In this chapter, it mentions many times about earthly things. But then also in the same chapter, there are references made to spiritual things or to heavenly things. And these heavenly things we know to be spiritual things. But he who has his mind upon Christ is primarily interested in the spiritual things more than the earthly things. How many times we want things, we desire them, we seek for them, we work for them. We want to control things. But before we know what has happened, things have controlled us. We get enslaved and ensnared and in bondage to things. But Paul learned not to be ensnared nor to be enslaved to things. When we are ensnared and enslaved to things, we lose our joy. But we can have joy when we have a spiritual mind. Then there is a mind that is secure. In chapter 4 of this book, Paul goes on to say, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul mentions here about the freedom from worry. I mentioned four things that rob us, but Paul deals with each of these four things in this book. And the secure mind is one that is relieved of people, circumstances, and things. Paul wrote this book to the Christians at Philippi who were experiencing difficulties. But he was saying to them, you ought to have Christian joy. Real joy. Now what does this have to say to us today? How can we have the joy of the Lord? We sing about the joy of the Lord. We read from the book of Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord is your strength. We recognize Jesus prayed that we might have his joy. Jesus, over and over again, spoke about us having joy. How can we really know this Christian joy? First of all, be sure that we're Christians. And how can we know that we're Christians? Again, we come back to the church at Philippi. But was it not at Philippi that Paul and Silas were thrown in prison? And we read this in Acts chapter 16, where that because of their ministry, they were, placed, they were placed in prison. And at midnight, mind you, after being beaten, their bodies wracked with pain from the 39 stripes across their back, they were chained. And at midnight, well, Paul and Silas grumbling and complaining, know what is the Bible tells us, tell us? At midnight, Paul and Silas were singing. Mind you, singing. And I'm sure it wasn't, wasn't the latest hit either. They were singing a song of praise to the Lord. Now, Then there was an earthquake, and the jailer ran in. He thought that everyone had escaped because the prison cells were opened, and he was ready to fall on his own sword to take his own life. And Paul said, Do thyself no harm. And this man ran and fell at his feet, and he said, What must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy entire household. And that very night, this Philippian gentleman and his family came to know Jesus Christ. We want joy, real joy, wonderful joy. Let Jesus come into your heart.
Then secondly, if we want real joy, admit it when we make mistakes. You know, I find some people, even professing Christians sometimes, who don't want to admit when they're making mistakes. But admit our failures. Admit them to ourselves and to God and to others if need be. Thirdly, surrender to Christ. And fourthly, go to work for Christ. That man who is the busiest for Christ is the happiest and the most joyful man. If we really want real joy, know Christ and go to work for him. Really go to work for him. A young convert, a young lady, was visited by her pastor. She was a patient in the hospital. And she sarcastically looked up at him and stated, I gave my heart to Christ just a few weeks ago. Now look what happened. I've landed up in the hospital. And he said to her, Are you worth the fact that God may have placed you here to witness to someone. Have you witnessed to anybody? Have you done anything for him? She admitted that she had done absolutely nothing for Christ. When circumstances, people, things bother us, Let's keep our eyes upon Jesus and let's go to work for him. Let's really work for him. Joy, real joy. Now these things that I've mentioned here, these four things that I said have troubled us, they trouble every one of us. But don't let them steal us of the Christian joy. And let's have real joy, the joy of the Lord during 1975. The Bible tells us that we as Christians have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. And this is, dear friends, is part of our inheritance. Now anything that my earthly father should will to me, I want. And anything my heavenly father should will to me, I want. If this is what he wants me to have, I want it. And let's have it during 1975. Let us pray. My Savior's love. Let's all stand as we sing.
May we remain standing for prayer, and Faye Davis, would you lead us, please? Page 227, 227. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Let's take the rest of the time. and offerings.
Mark, the book of Acts, chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Acts, chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed no, us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one. Because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang up on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, Yet vengeance, vengeance suffered not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In verse 2, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. Among all of us daily, we will find both Christians and non-Christians who at times will show us a certain degree of kindness. We're familiar with the story of Paul, along with 275 others on board the ship, and for 14 days and nights, mind you, a long time for a storm, the jets, they were on board a storm in a, a tempestuous tempest sea. And the people have lost all appetite, any some of them any desire to live. And yet Paul, in the midst of this, one night cried out, Do yourselves no harm, do not abandon the ship, for this night I have heard from God. And if we stay on board, the whole ship will be saved. We are well how the ship broke up, and everyone that possibly could get hold of, that, that could swim, swam to shore. Others got hold of boards, or some piece uh, from the ship to make it into shore. And every single person made it safely to the shore. And when they were there, the natives came and showed them kindness, built a fire, and received them. Now, I like for us tonight to note these words, for they kindle a fire and received us every one. Then the, the people who have been out of the ocean, not in the storm, were cold. The weather had been very damp. The atmosphere was very damp. And as they were all gathering together, 276, shivering, the barbaric, pagan, non-Christian people showed them kindness, received them, built a fire, and helped them to be warm and to take care of their various needs. Now, there are times in our lives in which people will experience coldness. There are times in which people might experience spiritual coldness. But nobody should be kinder and more responsive to the needs 
of others than Christian people. I would, as a Christian, <clears throat> be very distressed with myself if I found that non-Christian people were kinder than I. Nobody should be more kind, more helpful, more hospitable than a Christian. For they kindle a fire. And I like for us to note tonight, this is Christians helping to start a spiritual fire. First of all, all of us at times may feel somewhat of a spiritual cold. Ernest Robinson, writing <clears throat> the hymn, wrote, Come to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Come to leave the God I love. Keep my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Now, the world about us is very cold, the spiritual thing. Many years ago, I listened to a lady as she would pray, Lord, this world is no friend of grace. And if we make it spiritually, we will have to go upstream against the currents of this world in order to make it. The world is cold to spiritual things. <clears throat> a few years ago, and I do not know what it is now, but seven years ago, I read this statistics that in America, only 2% of our entire population of America will be in church on Sunday night. That was 10 years ago. 98% of the people in America will not be in church tonight. This world is no friend of grace. It is a cold world in many ways, cold spiritually. Grant you, there may be many people who will show a tremendous amount of kindness. And thank God for these. There are so many influences about us, so many things, to cause us to grow cold in our relationship to God. There will be worldly influences. There will be amusements. There will be friends. Sometimes just simply fatigue, physical, emotional, and mental fatigue. If we give way to it, it will cause us to go cold in our relationship to Jesus Christ. Christians must realize what should take priority, what should be first. We may go cold by staying away from spiritual things. We know those things that will benefit us the most spiritually. And if we neglect these things, then we will go cold. There will be people, if we will allow them, who will dampen our spirits, who will discourage. There may be well-wishers, may be friends, may be people of any walk who may to some extent will put a damper upon us. A year and a half ago, I listened to a neighbor who said, Oh, you Quakers have church on Sunday night. I would never be a Quaker because I don't want to go to church on Sunday night. And all along, you know, 
Well, as time went on, I do not mean to say this with any harshness or disrespect. Wonderful people, but then I realized that was not the real desire for much spiritually. So much that can cool us off from my fervor, from my zeal, from my enthusiasm for Jesus Christ. But then there comes the need for us to be warm in our souls. And I like that so much that John Russell records in his journal. He came to America as a missionary and made a complete failure. Why? Because John Russell realized that he had never experienced Christ himself. And he went back home. And he wrote in his journal later on. He said, when he went to Aldersgate, the church, he said, my heart was strangely warmed by the presence of God. We need a warming in our own souls. Now, many times we pray by warming in the church. But before there can come a warming in the church, individuals themselves must get near the fire. Kindling a fire. We must individually by a prayer life, family praying, <clears throat> praying together at church, Individual praying. Now, there are many avenues of prayer, many ways of praying. But that to me, which is perhaps one of the most meaningful of all, is when I get alone with God. Communion with God. Frequently in prayer, I catch myself quoting. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. Let me ask you a question and see it. Do you ever have this experience? Perhaps when you feel that your heart has grown cold and you start to pray, and lo and behold, there are a thousand things that are converging upon you. And there are so many things that you need to do. So many places to go, so much work to be done. There are so many responsibilities. And as you start to pray, you feel like, well, I'm not really getting anywhere in my prayer. And you find a whisperer, mind you, a whisperer, and it is Satan whispering, that is saying to you, Why don't you do something else now and come back to pray later on? When you may be getting near the fire, when you may be getting near the spiritual one, and the devil knows it and is trying to keep you from getting your heart warmed by God. I think of individuals pouring out their hearts before God and they made contact with God. I remember hearing a man, a businessman, who told me a few years ago, he said, I remember so well my heart being so cold. And he said, I got out of bed one night, and he said, I was desperate for something from the Lord. And he said, I went down on my knees beside the bed and poured out my heart to God. And he says, Billy, to this day, yet I have never forgotten that experience. For so said he, I knew I had made contact with God.
When I was in Bible school, I had a friend who had just called into the ministry. He was 45 years of age when he was saved. He was a retired lieutenant colonel from the army. And he went to a Bible school in three years, preparing for the ministry. And he worked on the side as an accountant, paying his way through school. And he said to me one day, he says, Billy, I've been so busy. And last night, he said, my heart felt so cold, spiritually. I was studying. I've been working hard, and now I was studying for my classwork, preparing for the ministry. And he said, I was at my desk. My heart was so cold, I just simply bowed my head, folded my arms and bowed my head, and prayed. Softly, quietly, and I waited upon God. And I felt that in his presence, I felt that he came and filled me up. I like this expression, he came and he filled me up. Waiting before God in communion and allowing God to fill us up. Our hearts can be strangely warmed by the presence of God. I believe this, that when individuals daily take the scriptures and pray as he reads the scriptures, asking God to help them, God can make these scriptures come alive. And these verses of scripture can be as a fire in our bones. I think as we study, and as we pray, and as we worship together, and as we commune with the Lord and then with one another's Christians, I believe so much that our hearts can be warm. Keep near to Christ. Keep near to Him. I think of two men, a businessman and a doctor, who very frequently would get together and discuss just briefly some things regarding the church. They, but they would never leave without one saying to the other, perhaps a businessman saying to the doctor, Doctor, say to me a few words about Christ, what he means to you. By keeping Christ foremost, they were able to keep their hearts warm. Keeping our hearts warm, kindling a fire. And then there's the third thing I'd like for us to know tonight. From my scripture here we know this. There is always a benefit to other people. When we, we should light a spiritual fire for someone else. There may be someone else who may be struggling in the sea. There may be someone else who needs a word of encouragement. There may be others who can see the light because our lives are burning brightly for Christ, there may be others who may be rescued, who may be saved. These men can be the fire. <clears throat> and it brought so much help, comfort, and strength unto others. And God help us to kindle a fire for other human beings. How many churches have come a lot 
because one, two, or three people kindle a fire. And under the most extreme of all circumstances, they kept this fire burning. Then note this, they kindled this fire, but it was under the most difficult circumstances. It had rained for days and nights. It was a very wet and moist time. It was under the most difficult circumstances. Now, I do not believe that any fire is ever kindled for God that is ever kindled under easy circumstances. I believe it's always under the most difficult and strained times. The days in which we are living, nationally and internationally, economically and in every way, are very strained times. But now is the time for the church to light a fire and to help those people who are struggling in the sea of life to see the fire of God burn. Now, not only was it in the most difficult of all circumstances, but every person had a part to play. Paul got a bundle of sticks. They were wet, but he brought them. And each one would bring a stick to place on the fire. And everyone was to be a help. And in the kingdom of God, every person has his part to play in starting a spiritual fire and starting a revival. A Britisher said, the various ways in which the church can come alive, become alert, can become awakened, can get on fire. And one of them is this, he said, is get under the sun. The Son of God stay near to stay with Christ to get near the fire and stay near the fire. Get in motion. Once we know Christ, tell someone about it. Tell someone what Christ means to you. And then stay on your knees. Keep in the spirit of prayer. Let no one dampen your spirituality. Let no one be a hindrance to you in the Christian life. Let us keep on our knees before God. But they kindle a fire. And let us, as professing Christians, kindle a fire that shall be of help to one another and to those who are struggling in the sea of life. May we stand. Our Father, I pray thee tonight that thy Holy Spirit shall so baptize and infiltrate each of our lives that we too may glow for thee. Help us, O Lord, that we might be willing to say, All for thee, all for thee. Make our lives to count for thee. Help us, O Lord, not to dampen the spiritual fire. Not to put out the glow, but help us, O Lord, to constantly to add, to encourage, to build up, to strengthen. Help us, O Lord, that we too may kindle a fire that people will want to know our cause. Is there someone who would like to come for prayer? we wait just for a moment. Is there someone? For them to have listened, how easy it would have been for Simon Peter to have listened.
How easy it would have been for George Fox, the founder of Quaker Wrestling, to have listened when they didn't appreciate him. Just simply give up. People do not appreciate you. But friends, may I encourage you to listen to the voice of the Spirit that says, be faithful. It is to God that we are to give an account and not unto other human beings. Although people may say, you are not appreciated, although Satan may say this, God is the one who shall judge, and it is before him that we shall stand. Be faithful unto him. And then there comes the whisper again that will say, well, other people can do a better job than you. And right here, the devil isn't lying. Because there is no, but there is no one, but some way that can do a better job than what you are doing. I recognize this fact as a minister and as a preacher. When the devil comes to me and say, now why do you preach? There are others who can preach much better than you. I will have to say, yes, Satan, there are people, many ministers who can far surpass me as a preacher. But I am to be faithful to do what I can do other people shall not give an account for a bit of bread, but I must give an account for myself. I must do what Christ has called me to do. The Lord wanted the one talented man to be just as faithful as the five talented man or the ten talented man. We must be faithful. I listened. One day, as a minister, who is now a very accomplished, very skilled pulpit there, who stayed in his early days in the ministry, he stood up, and he, in the audience, were two or three of the leading ministers of the eastern part of the United States. And one of these was a president, a president of Asbury Seminary, Henry Clay Marston. And this minister said that as a young man he stood and he was frightened out of his wits. And he thought, why should I try to preach whenever these very skilled ministers are here? And yet, he thought God had called him to preach. How many times Sunday school teachers have thought, why shall I try to teach when there are more learned people in my class? How many times people have tried to sing or tried to witness or to speak when they knew that there were those who were present more skilled than they? But my Lord has called me, and he has called you, to a life of faithfulness. There may be other people who can far surpass you in ability. Nevertheless, our Lord has called us to be faithful unto him. Will we be faithful? Just suppose that we should become unfaithful. What would happen? First of all, we would thwart the plan of God. He has called us to a particular task. And this would be displeasing unto him. And it would thwart the plan of God for our lives. There would be other people who would miss out on the blessings of our Heavenly Father. And I recognize this tonight. Several years ago, I was in a revival meeting, and I learned, not from this relative of mine, 
but from a person who was very active in that congregation. But I learned that there was one person in that audience, one person at least, who was depending upon Billy Bread. And if I let God down and let him down, I recognize the consequences. There are those human beings who are depending upon us. And if we are unfaithful, we shall hinder them. My soul and your soul shall become endangered when we become unfaithful unto our Lord. We are called upon to a life of faithfulness. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Are we willing, at any cost, whether it be ridicule, misunderstanding, are we willing to be faithful completely unto our Lord? Are we willing to pay the price to do his will? A lady who attended a congregation that had very little spiritual life in it went to a gathering in which there was a dynamic spiritual life. And it was at this meeting that she received what we as Quakers call the baptism with the Holy Spirit. She made a total commitment of her life. She came back home, bubbling over with joy and enthusiasm. And Norma Vincent Peale has said many times, enthusiasm makes the difference. And well, this is exactly what happened to this lady. She was filled with the Spirit and she was so enthusiastic. And she came back to her church and the first service was a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And she stood up and gave a testimony of what the Lord had done for her in her life. Well now, the pastor bowed his head. 